Good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. Welcome to another edition of Operation Separation. I'm your host, Shell Shapiro. Uh, and with me today is the amazing Dorit Carlson. I'm excited to dive into this topic today. Uh, it is something that is close to my heart, uh, especially right now. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to get started. Dorit, why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Shell. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, your program is awesome and, and your lives are always so entertaining and amusing and inspirational. So this is a this is an honor. Um, I'm Dorit Carlson. Uh, I live in Norway on the southwest coast. Um, I'm, yeah, in my 50s, let's say that. <laughs> have raised five kids and now I have a little grandson that's three years old. So all our children have um, left the nest. Um, I am a dog breeder, so I breed Basenjis. That's my passion. Um, but I'm also a um, heart coach and a hypnotherapist. So I like to help people and, and I like to do a lot of stuff to kind of keep it, keep it diversity, you know, do a lot of different things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whew, that's, that's a lot of things. Um, and I, I'm here for it. I love, I love, um, multi-passionate, multi-potential like women, especially that, that have like their hand in different areas. Um, but when you boil it down, it all really comes down to the little things, no matter what area you're focusing on. Right. Absolutely. So, so talk to us a little bit today. Um, like, and for everybody I'm sure knows my story by now, but for, for you, like it, the little things got overlooked in your personal and your professional life. Right. So uh, whether you want to talk about one or the other, or a little bit of both, why don't, why don't you share with everybody what that looked like for you? Yeah. Um, I like to, to start when I was, well, when I was a kid and I, um, I was raised to be a good girl and I became a people pleaser and an empath and I wanted to make life better for everyone else. And I forgot about me. So by the time I was in my thirties, I had been doing that for such a long time and taking care of everyone else's needs, uh, both privately and in my work. Um, then I worked in, in shops. I'm a hairdresser and a beautician and I worked 10 years in a pet shop as a manager for a pet shop, actually, um, sniffing hamsters. Um, <laughs> so, um, I experienced a terrible burnout about 10 years ago and, um, I got so ill that I ended up in hospital for a week and I couldn't work for seven years. Um, just because I ignored the little things, the little signals. I didn't listen to my body and I didn't listen to anyone. Actually, I just thought I could do everything <laughs> really. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and because, because you yourself ignored the little things that were going on with you and those warning signs, um, I, it's, it's said sometimes that like, you show other people the way that you want to be treated the way by the way you treat yourself. I know I'm paraphrasing whatever that amazing quote is, uh, but the gist is there, right? So mm -hmm. by you ignoring the little things that were going on in your own life, other people then were ignoring them too, right? Like even, yeah. even at times when you were like saying, no, I, I can't do this. Um, this is too much. And, and they just kind of like shrugged it off or ignored it all together. So yes. what, what actually like, what did burnout feel? I've been through burnout, so uh, I can totally relate to this, but what did your burnout feel like? Like when, when you just couldn't anymore? Um, it started with little warning signs from my body, little red flags. I got aches and pains. Um, they were moving around. Uh, one day I could, barely use my arm and the next day my hip was hurting so bad that I had a limp. Um, but the job that I had didn't have any um, 
there was not well, wasn't anyone that could like fill in for me if I called in sick. So I had to go, otherwise the shop would close. And I I didn't have that. I, I couldn't do that. You know, um, I would have to be <laughs> close to dead before I stayed home um, and not went to open the shop and 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 kept the things going. So. Um, then the, the, my brain didn't function. Um, it kind of switched off. So I, I, I didn't have any memory. I forgot so much and I made so many mistakes at work and I was so, so tired. I remember between customers, I would go into the office and sit down on a chair and, and I was just like nod off until the bell rang in the door and a new customer came and, I cried in the car on my way to work and I cried in the car on my way home from work. And, and it was, yeah, it was terrible. And, uh, um, the, the change came actually when, when I s went to see, um, like a holistic therapist because of all the pain that I had, I thought actually that it, this was, um, from a tick bite, that this was symptoms from a tick bite that my body was dealing with. I, I had no idea I was burned out. I had to be sick, right? <laughs> you know, I couldn't be burned out. I could do anything. So, um, yeah, uh, I went to him and he said, you should, you should see a, a doctor. You should be hospitalized now. And I went to see my doctor the same day and they put me in an ambulance and they, they drove me right into hospital and I stayed there for a week taking a lot of tests and, and it wasn't a tick bite. Nope. <laughs> so, yeah. What was there ever a time, like what was going on in your personal life at this time? Like, was there ever a time that like your family and your friends and your support system were, were concerned about what was going on? Like what, what was their reaction to all of this? Yeah, for sure. Um, my husband got to the point where he was angry because he could see that I was pushing myself too hard and I'd never time for him, of course. Um, it was the kids and it was the the, the, uh, the shop and it was the, the dogs and it was the house and all of the other things uh, had kind of preference before me. So um, he, he tried his best to kind of put the brakes on, but I, I just ignored it because I was on a freight train and I was just going. So, uh, we had a lot of arguments actually about that because, yeah. well, he, he wanted me to take time to, to just relax, to just sit down. But I was like, no, I have to go to work and, and fix those papers. No, I have to, uh, exercise the dogs because I'm, I'm going to a dog show in two weeks and no, I have to, you know, uh, yeah. So, that was not an option. Yeah. And, and, and the kids uh, didn't help pick up the slack at all, or you just didn't allow them to help? Well, at that time, the youngest one were five oh. and the oldest one was 15 and, and they had their own things. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So the small, the two small ones, they were five and seven and they would come in the garage actually waiting for me when I parked the car coming home from work everyone came home from work before me and they would just be there waiting and and mom what's for dinner and i'm like i don't know i'm not home yet you know i, I can't remember what i have in the cupboard and i don't remember what's in the fridge i i will have to to go and see what i can find because my my husband can't make dinner um yeah but he he would give them like bread and stuff but mom always makes dinner so yeah, yeah. And, and i guess at this point like <laughs> you had conditioned, again, the others around you to like what you were willing to do for them that they didn't even have to insert themselves to be like, all right, let's take this off mom's plate tonight. Like we could see she's, she's overwhelmed. Like, let's start, let's get dinner started. And then she can like, and prep the stuff or set the table. Mm -hmm. um, did that ever happen? Or, or like, really, they were that conditioned to, to expect you to do it? No, um, when this went on for for a while um it, it <laughs> i told them to start something i mean you can peel the potatoes you can you can start putting on water to boil the spaghetti or just do something so so things have started when i get home you know 
and yeah. and they did that uh, yeah they they tried helping as much as they could and and in the weekends when i didn't um spend all my days at work because i went to work saturdays and sundays too but um i could show them a little bit around the kitchen and and that was a really good thing because now um all of them are really good at making food yeah. <laughs> so so it's not all bad no <laughs> yeah and yeah so i, I want to just like take a moment to say like i don't mean to to shift blame on onto like your family or anyone that like wanted to help and just couldn't um i just am trying to get a bigger picture and have everybody see like there was a bigger picture going on here of like what what you were used to doing and it's hard to stop when you're like oh, yeah. It's really hard to switch off mm -hmm. when you're conditioned to be a certain way all the time. Yeah. And, and so, I, yeah, I, I'm not placing blame on your kids or, or <laughs> no, no. Kid at the time. I'm, I, but like the little things built up, like all the oh, things yeah. you were doing for everybody really took a toll on your body. And even yourself, like, it seems like you just expected that to be a little thing that would pass. Mm -hmm. that oh, they yeah. were, oh, they yeah. were all related. Uh, mm -hmm. I can, I know for me, when I burnt out, it didn't happen overnight. Like that's not something that just happens. Nope. Um, it builds up over time. It's a series of little things that just keep adding up. And then it gets to a point where it's so blatantly like you can't do anything else. For me, it was like I had acid reflux. I had heartburn, indigestion all the time. Like I just thought that that was a normal feeling because I had it all the time. Like when, when pain is like your normal and, mm. and you're like, oh, a normal amount of pain. No, pa any pain at all is not normal. Uh, like that's not a good thing. But like I had just identified all of that as like, all right, I could, it's my normal every day. I can navigate it because this is what I'm used to. But then like the shooting pains down my arm and I'm talking about my left arm and like the pain in my chest, like simulating a heart attack, except it was an anxiety or a panic attack. Um, the brain fog, which, which like for me being powered on all the time and still trying to like get all the things done and get all the things done well and not make mistakes. That was really hard to, I hid that for a while because I just kept pushing through because nobody could see that I was falling apart. Right. Like I, I, I tried to hide it. Like I didn't want to seem like I was lesser than like that. I wasn't at my peak. So I hid that I was falling apart for a while too. Um, so I was in, I was, I was not in, in a good space. Let's just like personally and professionally and, and everything outside of work didn't help either. Uh, the, the relationships that I was in at the time. Um, but it just came to a head and I couldn't ignore the little things anymore because they had become such a huge thing that was critical to my life and my well-being. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's shift gears to the opposite of that now. Like, so you you've taken time to separate yourself. You you recover spent seven years recovering and going on this heal, healing journey. Um, of course, we're all still works in progress, so the journey doesn't end, but it took you a while to get back into what your life, what you wanted your life to look like. Um, how, how, did you, how did you navigate those seven years while you weren't able to work? First of all, I went into a grieving process. Uh, I, I had a terrible, terrible uh, sadness and 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 i was so depressed that my that my life was over <laughs> it felt like my life was over because i was no longer um able to to be that dorit i i wasn't able to to be that person in people's lives that i had been um and to me that was terrifying and and i was crying and uh, but I, I, in the back of my mind, I realized that I'm, I can't go back to a, a job where I have a boss because I will push myself again. I will uh, not be able to say no. I will do the best I can because I want to be the good girl, like I'm conditioned to be, you know, and, and I didn't want that. So um, I, I, <laughs> I tried to 
to work on my mental health first. The the physical, the, the diagnosis that I've got, um, the doctor said there was nothing to do about those. I, they gave me pain pills and sleeping pills and, and say, you, well, you feel when you have done too much. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and I, <laughs> I, um, went to Facebook one day and there I saw an ad for a Norwegian coach that had an academy called Leadership by Heart Academy, where they were taking up new students. Um, and that kind of coaching was something that really caught my attention because I could work from home. Um, I could use my intuition and my empathy, which I have in, in buckets. So it was kind of something that I felt that, oh, maybe I can do this. You know, I can, I can work from home, I can do some good. So um, I invested in that education and I haven't regretted it because those uh, sessions that we had there, we, we, um, we worked on ourselves, you know, so I, I got an education and I got my mental health worked on at the same time. Yeah. So it was, it was worth the money, let's say that. Um, and, and feeling that I, I, could help someone again that I could be useful. Uh, that was that was just amazing, and and uh, I started taking better care of myself, uh, doing the little things, you know. Uh, that was um, that was the change for me. Yeah, uh, I I think it's remarkable how how much work you you did on yourself to really figure out what you needed to be okay. Um, and what that, what that needed to feel like, what that needed to look like, what you needed to put yourself around in order to feel supported and not only not take yourself for granted anymore, uh, but also to not have others take you for granted anymore. Mm. So that's, that's a huge, that, I want to celebrate that. I want to drop some confetti <laughs> as you know, I love like, I love, I love having like a celebration moment. And I think that's worth yeah. sharing because it's not a small thing. No. Um, I, I mean, it is, it is a huge thing, but it's also a series of little things yes. that have transformed your life. Right. Um, Absolutely. And, and part of the, so let's, let's talk about the dog training, um, and the breeding that you do with Basenji is when, when you're training and you're showing the future owners or current owners of dogs, how to interact with their animals, um, with their, with their fur babies. Yeah. Um, what are some of the little things that you notice keep coming up that you can show them how to do to their, their fur babies? Uh, the most important thing I teach them is to, to read their dog, to kind of learn the dog language, to see the signs that they're sending, how they, how they speak with their bodies, um, because Basenjis doesn't bark. So, but they have like facial expressions, their ears up and down, the tail, uh, the way they move their body, and all the kinds of things like that that I can teach them so they can understand their dog. And and um, I, in that regard, you can also teach people to use kind of, uh, we call it calming signals, for instance, if you have a dog that's really upset, uh, super eager, or you have a dog that's worried about a situation, you can um, teach the, the owners to, to um, calm it down without using words. Um, a, a typical calming signal for a dog is to yawn and lick its lips. So a dog is not tired when it's yawning. A dog is is calming down itself or calming down a situation if it yawns. And the same with with if the tongue comes out, then it's also trying to to tell you or or someone that it's that it's um, it's not dangerous. I'm I'm just I'm just chilling over here. You know, yeah. Yeah. resetting so, themselves a little yeah. bit. Yeah. So so things like that is super important. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, mm -hmm. I think that that's so relatable because the work that you're doing with dogs and to train owners how to interact with them is applicable for humans as well like oh, yeah. paying attention and that's part of the the intuition and the the empathy part of that like 
um, emotional intelligence of like watching cues and you could say and infer a lot of things and communicate a lot of things without actually using any actual words. So mm-hmm. paying attention to the body language, seeing what's going on, seeing how they're reacting and acting in certain moments, I think is really telling to be able to support them in the way that they need, uh, whether whether you're a dog or a human. Uh, mm-hmm. And so I, I love, I, so I ask about the dogs because I know it's applicable in other parts of, of life. So uh, yeah, I, I love your, some of your trainings too. And also the way that you have said that, um, that dogs don't yawn when they're tired, they're doing it to like calm themselves down and reset a little bit. Um, and I don't mean to call you out on this, but we, we, we do this on our weekly calls. Um, you do something to reset yourself too, right? It's not a yawn, yeah. uh, but why don't yeah. you share with everybody who hasn't seen this in action, if, if you don't mind, if you're comfortable yeah. with that. Um, sure. Dorit has a, has a very unique way for her of, of resetting herself and, and calming herself down, getting back to center, getting back to her heart. So yeah, I'd love if you could share that with people. <laughs> Yeah, and that was one of the of the many things I learned uh, taking the leadership by heart uh, education to just close my eyes and just repeat for myself, I know and I trust. That's and take a deep breath. That's that's all I'm doing. So by saying I know and I trust, I mean I know everything I need to know about this, and I trust myself to deliver it. I trust myself to perform. I trust myself to, to handle this. So, so that's, that's all it is, but it's super powerful. And I really recommend people trying it. If you have um, nerves before a job interview or an exam or a a live or whatever it is. Um, And I also use it, as you say, during our lives on Thursdays, because then we are many people on the live and, and everyone is talking and coming up with their take on, on the team. And, and I'm just trying to, to be in me and, and be um, ready to, to deliver my truth, so to speak, you know? Mm-hmm. So, so that's why I'm, I'm resetting and you see me yeah. closing my eyes and breathing during the lives. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great way for you to stay present with what's going on and being spoken about in the moment and to mm-hmm. like really honor yourself, but also hear people, hear every, all, everybody around you and what's going on. Um, and I, while you were explaining that that little that little thing that people can do to reset themselves and and it only takes a few seconds like it's not something that you have to like stay in for for longer than that so that is it's a great example of a little thing that you can do to change course for the day um but also i i did it as well you had your eyes closed i closed my eyes for a moment i didn't say it out loud um because i wanted everybody to be able to hear your you speak um, but I did say it to myself and yeah, it does, it does work. And I shared with you as well that right before coming on today, um, I was taking a few moments to breathe and stretch and, and regroup myself. So, uh, for me, that's, it's not something that, that can be done on screen. I am literally laying on the floor over there, um, and stretching out my body because I'm like, let me shake out the nerves. Let me just like reset my body um, yep. more than just my my mind. And for me, that needs to be all sprawled out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I won't reenact that here, but I also <laughs> have my way of doing it too. Um, and that's just a little thing for me, uh, yeah. just to, again, calm the nerves and center myself. Um, not because I'm doubting myself necessarily, but because I want to quiet all the other things that are going on yeah. in my life, mm. inside of me, uh, yeah. so that I can show up and be present in this moment with with the topic at hand and not let all the other things bu- bubble up to the surface. Of course. Um, so, so yeah, I, I love being able to show people the way that, that we do these little things to help um, make ourselves better and get through the day. And these, these little things add up. Certainly it's not the only thing that we've done. Um, I, I love working um, and chatting with you. We had done a, 
a hypnotist, like a hypnotherapy session, um, which I had never done before doing it with you. And that was really powerful and trans transformative as well. And for that, that was like a series of little things that I was just tuning into. Um, and I had absolutely no control over it. I just had to let go and what happened, what happened, happened, what came up, came up. Um, and I just had, it kind of like took over my mind and my body and everything. Um, so that was, that's another great way that people can like work with you to, to have that transformative and life-changing experience. And again, it's such a little thing, but those little, it's a little thing that adds up to a bigger thing that can have impact. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah because one of those little things is that when I say, I know, um, I know when I trust, you know, when I say I know, it's because we have so much information stored inside us. And, and you found that in the, in the hypno hypnosis, um, that things just came up, things that you haven't thought of in years, things that you, you didn't even realize that you knew. And it was kind of giving you uh, information, making sense, even today, you know, uh, and, and um, having a different perspective on things. And I didn't tell you anything. I didn't give you any information. I didn't tell you any stories. I didn't give any suggestions. Uh, you just found that information within yourself. So yeah. that's that's one of the, the the I know parts because you have it you have it inside you. It's in well, I say it's in your heart, but it can be in your soul or in your DNA or in your subconscious mind or or call it whatever. But uh, that's what I go looking for with my clients and find the answers that yeah. they have within. Yeah, and and that's part of the intuition as well that. You, you help guide people to tap into that. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, Dora in no way prompted me uh, on like anything that I should be seeing or hearing or experiencing. She all, I'm, I'm dumbing this down to like very, <laughs> very bare bones yeah. for anybody who has not had this experience, but you literally just talked me through relaxing myself. Yeah. Um, and then I asked you questions. Getting into a relaxed open state where I could just let things come in. Mm. Um, and certainly this may not be everybody's experience with it, but like, I just had this like localized energy that shot to my eyes. Um, I remember you said it looked like I was having a, like a seizure um, <laughs> because my eyes were just like blinking so rapidly. Um, and the energy was all localized there. And I was fully aware of everything that was going on. This is not like a hypnosis where like you, somebody snaps their fingers and tells you to come back to like reality. And like, then they say a, a trigger, like a word and you start quacking like a duck or you start doing the chicken dance or whatever silly thing that they've told you to do. There was, there was none of that. I was completely aware of everything that was going on around me. Um, and my cat at the time, uh, it was like a month or so before she had passed. And I remember she, I was trying to fight the energy that was around my eyes. I was like, I was trying to blink. I was trying to like slow it down. And then I realized that that was what was needed to happen for me to, to absorb all the things. I had the answers within me. You're right. I had, I knew my truth. I knew what was right for me and I just had to let go and let it come out. Um, but being totally present in that moment with all of my surroundings at the same time, Bella was running back and forth across my lap on the couch. And I was I like, remember. do I throw her off? <laughs> no, I don't want to break my focus. I don't want to break the moment of what's going on. I was literally just letting her run back and forth and jump across me. And it wasn't until afterwards, like not even a, a month or two afterwards. I think it was like a good six months afterwards because we're coming up on a year soon. And, and I reached out to you and I said, I think she was like, she felt the energy and was trying to tell me what was going to happen. Um, so even, even now, just that one session that we had, and that was an hour that, mm -hmm. that, that wasn't, that wasn't like a series of, of sessions. That was one hour that we both took and it's, I'm still having realizations from it. Yeah. So it's just such a great way to get in touch with yourself and what you already know, but may have 
forgotten or pushed aside. Uh, so well, you don't need to know that you need to know it. I mean, yeah. making decisions, uh, we often search for uh, information and answers from the people around us or from uh, from Google, <laughs> let's say that, but we have it inside us. So people aren't aware of that and, and they don't go searching for this information um, and, and aren't aware that it's available. And it's so satisfying and powerful for me to be able as a guide, that's why I call myself a heart guide because I just guide them close my eyes and I, I guide them by questions to find their answers, what they need to know uh, about the situation they're in, um, if they have phobias um, or anxiety for anything, we can get find the cause of it, what happened in your past that, that kind of um, turned out this way. You know, um, I had, um, can I take a quick story, just a, a quick yes, one? Yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Um, I had a, um, a lady sitting next to me on a plane from um, Stavanger to Turkey. We we're going to Alan, um, Antalya, Turkey. And uh, she was super, super nervous. She was so afraid of flying. She had had a couple of drinks that, uh, to calm her nerves. And, and her husband was sitting in the seat behind me. And, and I could see she was pale and sweating. And, and she was really uncomfortable. And I asked her if I could just do the, the meditation on her and if I could maybe guide her to see if she could discover something. What? Because she, she, she couldn't understand why she was afraid of flying. No, nothing has happened. Um, you know, she'd never had any issues or, or anything like that, but she's always been terrified of flying. Yeah. So I, I guided her and she discovered that the reason she was afraid of flying was all the way back to when she was in in children's school, like in, in one of the lowest grades. And um, she had been ducked down in snow and, and they had washed her face in snow. A, a lot of kids holding her, pushing her down into the snow. And that feeling of, of um, being not being able to breathe and, and the panic of being held down had transferred into being helpless inside a plane that she felt that she couldn't save herself in a way if she was in this plane so when she realized that and she could see that incident uh, when it happened and she understood that it just had nothing to do with planes um, it all made sense to her she could kind of transform that into something that gave her strength and after we finished that session, she was sleeping the whole rest of the flight. It's about five hours flight. And her husband was just tapping my shoulder and like, what did you do to her? She never sleeps on a plane. She's usually like clawing in the ceiling, but, but with anxiety. And, and I just told him that we found what was her issue and, and everything went well. And uh, I met them again going back from Turkey um, after my vacation and uh, she was cool as a cucumber and ready to, to go on that flight. So, so things like that, it gives me tremendous pleasure. It's a small thing for me to do, but it's an enormous thing for the person that experiences it. So. Yeah, I mean, that one the one little exercise like you tran you changed her life for the better because mm -hmm. now she can navigate it in a way where she won't have to yeah har have all that pent up anxiety and fear flying um mm -hmm. maybe maybe now she's flying more yeah. and and not holding herself back from being in those situations Mm -hmm. um, because that made might have been something that kept them from traveling more together. Oh yeah, oh that yeah, definitely. Some, and we don't know that might have been something mm -hmm. that like that's why her husband didn't sit next to her. Like I can't yeah. next, next <laughs> to you when you're like this. Yeah. Um, so, and I like I'll be behind you. I'm still near near you, but like I just don't know how to help you. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna separate from it. But that probably also helped their relationship. Um, and oh, I yeah. don't mean to be laughing about it. It's not. It's not meant to be in a silly way. It's a serious thing. It's when a joyful it's, thing, you know, I mean, yeah, that transformation mm. to somebody yeah. and to guide them through that. Definitely. And, and talking about relationships, 
that's where I'm really um, very excited about the little things. Um, mm -hmm. I've been together with my husband for 30 years. My parents have been married for over 60 years. So that long term, long term relationship thingy is kind of something that I've learned um, how to navigate. And a lot of it has to do with the little things. So I just wanted to throw that out here um, while we are talking on the subject that in the private yeah. area, in the in the relationship with your with your partner or your kids, the the little things are super super important. Yeah, and and the danger of that again when you don't acknowledge the little things or when you get used to or comfortable doing certain things and they're over there doing their certain things and there's no in between or like fusion to come together and like, Hey, do you still enjoy doing these things? Like, how can I help you? What can I take off your plate or whatever the love language is uh, mm -hmm. at that point. But like, that's where things can get taken for granted. Um, okay. If you're, if you're just going through the motions every day and you're like, all right, this is how I show up. This is what I do every day for my partner. This is what I do for myself. This is what I do for my kids. This is what I do for my boss. Um, and it becomes like very cyclic hmm. cycle. <laughs> if that's, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I use the right word there. So, um, Carl will have to tell me if I, if that's the right <laughs> word that I used. Um, but when you, when you get into that process, of then like coming back together and realizing like, all right, how how can we change? How can we keep things interesting? How, how do we keep things livened up and like get that spark back if you've lost it? How do we not take each other for granted? How do we communicate better? Whatever those little things are that you're feeling neglected over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that you talk about like creative ways to to like help people uncover like the little things that they can be doing so what are some of those creative ways um it, it can be all from from simple things like um now that everyone has a a smartphone and uh, we are very focused on the phone usually and a little thing can be when your partner enters the room look away from your phone <laughs> just uh, smile to your partner let them see that you have noticed him and hi you know how are you doing today and and oh good you're home and and things like that and not just oh mm, yeah hi and and stare down into your phone um it can be sending a text message of course when your loved one is at work or out doing whatever um like i'm thinking about you and uh, just a little smiley face and a heart or whatever. Um, if you uh, write a little note and put in his pocket or, you know, uh, if, if by any chance someone still makes someone's lunch box, box. <laughs> I've never, never done that for my husband. He has to, he has to feed himself during the day. Um, <laughs> so, but um, just, uh, just, Tiny notes, uh, sending a message, uh, little gestures, them pressures, yeah. uh, the presents. I mean, and and um, it doesn't have to cost anything, and it doesn't have to take long. But they mean so much. We all want to be noticed. We all want to be seen, and we all want to be important. So uh, by by forgetting to do those things, by letting that slip, and and thinking that's not important. Um, of course, your partner will feel that he's not important in your life anymore. You 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 don't notice him, don't give him attention, and and then all of a sudden, when you uh, meet in the bedroom, then everything should be like hopla, you know. And and it's it doesn't work like that because there has to be a connection, and and we have to create that connection ourselves by by doing those little things. Uh, yeah. And you mentioned love language, which I am really. Um, a fan of of trying to find out what is people's love language and and um, because that makes it so much easier for for us to show love to the person in front of us. If we know the love language, we can show it in the way that they understand so much better. You know, um, mm. yeah. 
Yeah. I, and I get, I think it's those little gestures, those little <laughs> like acknowledgements, the little bits of appreciation that are not expected. Mm. Uh, that like that, that maybe they don't come out of nowhere, but like maybe, but it's, it's something that like will make them feel good that you're just doing just, just because, just because yeah. you want to, you want to brighten their day with something. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it, yeah I, my love language is not always the same. Like I think primarily in, in the workplace, I think I, I really appreciate, um, words of appreciation because sometimes other things, especially when we're, when we're still virtual in, in most parts, like there's not other ways, many other ways to, for me to feel appreciated. Like I want to know I'm doing a good job. I want to know that like I'm on the right track, like just reaffirm for me. Like those, mm -hmm. those, the little things that I'm doing that like are adding up and not going unnoticed um, in an, in a personal setting. Like I'm not, but I, so like, I think I've been conditioned to have like acts of service because that's what I grew up around. Um, mm -hmm. Used to doing, providing acts of service for other people as their love language. So mm -hmm. I think I've been conditioned to want that as well. And then I get frustrated when acts of service are not just done for me. Um, even when I've asked for help with things, hint, yeah. hint for anybody watching. Um, but <clears throat> sometimes I feel like I shouldn't have to like ask. I just want something nice to like be done for me that like, you know, I would be struggling with um, or like would just appreciate being taken off my plate. Um, I'm not really great at receiving gifts. So like, because I'm always like, oh, you didn't need to do that instead of just being able to receive it. Um, even if it's something that I wanted and, and would like, I'm like, oh, you didn't need to do that because I've been conditioned to do things for myself. So I'm like, ah, I could have done that for myself. I could have bought myself that, but like the gesture is still there. So I know it's not my love language because I have a hard time like accepting it. Hmm. Um, but I do appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Just don't ask me to open the gift in front of you. But like, I can appreciate when that's somebody else's love language, right? Like when, mm -hmm. when I know somebody like will appreciate me giving them a little token of my, like a physical token of my appreciation. Um, mm -hmm. A big one for me is quality time. Like for me, that's the best gift I can give is because my time is valuable. Your time is valuable. And so me just spending time with you, it means a lot. Even if we do mm -hmm. nothing, but like sit on the couch and watch TV or take a nap together or like just having you there is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, just, my, hus my husband is the same. Yeah. Yeah. Like we don't even, we don't even have to do anything. Like I asked my boyfriend earlier, I was like, can you just help me? I like, I need, I need help with, and he was like, what do you need help with? And I was like, well, I don't actually like know what I actually need help with. I said, but like, it would just help if you were here, like yeah. while I'm doing the thing, like maybe mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't need to like actually help me take us off my plate, but like, it would just help if you were here with me so that I'm not doing it alone. Um, so yeah, just being able to ask for what you need and, mm. and your partner or your boss or your colleague or whatever the relationship is being open to acknowledging and no, and receiving not mm. the love language, not the receiving, receiving a love language, but like open to receiving what it is that you need so that they can best support you. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. I had, a, I had, um, well, all my, all the five children have different love languages, but my youngest, she just turned 22 and, uh, her love language growing up was, um, the, the physical to sit on my lap and have just be held or, or get a, a good hug or, uh, you know, just stroking her cheek or her hair or something like that. So she felt the connection that was the most important for her and when she got well when she was in in that terrible threes and and the furious fives and and all of that she was um coming to me and she asked me can we can we fill up my we call it a cuddle tank tank like a tank <laughs> oh. of, of cuddles she just wanted to fill up that cuddle tank so she came and, and she sat on my lap and she's like oh it's full now and she could run off you know <laughs> and and they this came back to her she had completely forgotten about it and it all came back to her now she's um living together with a with a wonderful guy and they've been together for many years and 
just a few months ago, she was she called me and she said, Mom, I just shared with my boyfriend about the, the cuddle tank. And I said, oh, wh wh what happened? You know, did, did you talk about the childhood? And she said, no, I had I had a day there where I wanted to. Um, I just needed it. I just needed to be held. And I and I it just came out. Can you can you fill my cuddle tank? And he was like, what? <laughs> fill your what? <laughs> <laughs> so she had to tell him about uh, being a, a little girl and, and sitting on mom's lap and just being held and I could tell a story or sing a song but that wasn't important the most important thing was just sitting there and, and um, he came to me later and said well uh, he, he was um, so glad that she had shared this with him and, and that was such a good thing for him to know that that sometimes it was enough just to just to give her a hug, just to hold her. And, and he thought that he might have to, you know, get the moon or something, you know, a, a big deal to, to kind of satisfy her. And he didn't know that it was just a simple thing like that could mean so much to her. So, yeah, yeah it's the little yeah. things. It, it is the little, it keeps coming <laughs> back to that because it's, yeah. it's the root of all things, mm. I think. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Physical touch is not definitely, definitely not my one of mine. Um, at least not the primary ones. I have to really be in the mood for it, and it has to be the right setting. Like it has to be with the right person. Like I can't just give out hugs, uh, even if I really need a hug. Like if I'm not surrounded by somebody where I feel that energy that I that I want to just embrace the like I. It's, it's just, I can't, I can't always be hugging. I don't always want, like, I'm not PDA, like let's hold hands. Um, but sometimes I do want a good hug. Like I do want a good snuggle session. Um, but I have to really, really be in the mood for it. So yeah, yeah they're recognizing what, what you like and what your the people in your life, your support system, um, mm. prefer is really yeah. important too. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh my God. Give, giving them the wrong love language can be <laughs> really upsetting um my son he he is 30 years old now and and growing up uh his love language was uh, quality time but i didn't know that i hadn't learned about the love language thing when when he was um growing up so um i just thought he was really ungrateful when we gave him gifts for, yeah. because he didn't he didn't care it was like yeah and you know are you aware of how expensive that was and you know things like that and and but he didn't care he just wanted mom to sit next to him when he was playing games on on the computer or uh you know going for a walk with the dogs he just wanted that time so yeah it's yeah. a good thing to realize about people around you because you can serve them in a way serve the love in a way that they receive it yeah mm. and so okay what can what can people look forward to in terms of so i know you're you're working on another book right um, yeah. um about all about the, like the dog stuff um when do you have like how is that going and what can we expect from that like what what are we diving into with that book oh um it's called you are the queen of your dogs and um, it's not just for women, of course, but it is about being that um, that leader that you can be uh, successfully both as a dog owner, but also a leader in your own life, in your own space, in your personal and, and professional life. Um, I do dive into special dog stuff like dog uh, psychology um what we talked about earlier with the dog language um i go into a little bit about breeding uh because yeah and and, and um uh, what's it called um uh imprinting puppies yeah that is super super important so um a lot of of dogs have problems with their anxiety or aggression or or things like that because they have been poorly imprinted um, when they were 
tiny puppies. So, so that's kind of a pet peeve for me to to spread information about. Uh, pet yeah, peeve. a pet, pet peeve about <laughs> pets. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so I bring up I bring up the book one because I I know you're doing amazing work working on this with Linda, um, mm -hmm. and and it, it it is a it is a process. Um, this will be your second book, correct? Yeah. Um, your yeah. second solo book because of second course we have book, our, yeah. our our group one and another mm -hmm. one on the way. Um, mm -hmm. So this is this is very exciting. Um, yeah. And I but I bring up the book specifically, and I knew I knew it was about dogs because. We're international here, so I'm I'm in New York for now, uh, in the states, and and you're over in Norway, in Norway, right? Norway, um, yeah. And and so people may not have the opportunity to breed dogs with you or learn from you in person when it comes to dogs, mm -hmm. but they can still get all this juicy dog information and relevant life leadership information from the book when it when it drops. Yeah. Um, and so I want people to be mindful that they can learn from you in that way as well. Um, but tell people how else they can work with you. Uh, talk about the the hypnotist, the leadership by heart, um, all the things, whatever you want to, whatever you want people to connect <laughs> with. Yeah. Whatever I want to throw in there. Um, yeah. Um, I just want to quickly explain the difference between the leadership by heart uh, coaching and the hypnotherapy. Yeah. Um, I sometimes use them separately and sometimes I all depending on the client I have to use both but I do prefer to use the leadership by heart coaching just because it gives such a powerful um, learning experience and information to the client to find the information within themselves so I tend to just use the hypnotherapy to kind of if some information is hidden if there by any chance are like blockages or as I call it, gatekeepers that, that won't let us in to that memory, to that feeling um, that they want to deal with, um, then, then um, hypnotherapy is, is something that we can use to kind of bypass those gatekeepers and, and find the, the right um, issue, so to speak. Um, I do a lot, like you said, in an hour. So this isn't a therapy that goes on for, for months and years. This is kind of a um, quick result, lasting result. It's really comfortable. Yeah. There might be crying, but that's <laughs> good. <laughs> um, no shame um, in having emotions. Nope. Uh, they can come and it, they are really welcome when they come because that just means that we have found the right the right issue. Um, people feel so much better afterwards. That is why I call myself a confidence coach because confidence and self-worth is a, a wonderful, wonderful byproduct, let's call it that, uh, end result of the, the coachings, whether it is to find information, to deal with not feeling good enough, to deal with uh, anxiety or depression or uh, fear of flying. Um, yeah. There is uh, so many areas that this touches that I have, <laughs> have yet to settle on a, on a, like a, a, a niche or a, one group of people that I help because I let my heart guide me. And when you do that, you can kind of deal with whatever is in front of you. Um, you don't have to have a group of people which is in a familiar situation to you related to what you sh have been through. So that's what most coaches coach on is what they have learned from experiencing things for themselves. But, but this, is, um, this is a totally different kind of coaching where we don't tell people what to do other than the uh, induction, the, the meditation in the beginning. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, uh, I have uh, packages of uh, three sessions and six sessions and that's, that's the, um, the yeah. That's about it because uh, we're like an onion. So I don't like to have just one session. In your case, you you didn't have like a big issue. 
but if people come to me with an issue um we are like an onion so if we peel down the first layer there is revealed another layer and, and another issue can kind of come up from that so yeah so that's why i like to to have the packages of, of three or six um, yeah. sessions yeah. Yeah. that makes so much sense because you don't want to just stop if there's still more to uncover mm -mm. Um, that can that can just spin spin uh, spin a bit out because you get a new you get a new issue you get rid of one of them but you you kind of surface another so uh, starting to deal with that on your own might not be the best thing so it's better to yeah to and i that. and i think onions regrow too so uh just because yeah. you peel back one layer doesn't mean the, the rest isn't still growing in there mm -hmm. uh, so yeah thank you so much for sharing um about more about the work that you do what is the best way for people to get a hold of you if they're interested in in doing some of these sessions um people can find me here on on linkedin um yeah. and dm me that's probably the easiest. Uh, I think my email address is there also, if they prefer that. Um, I can be found on Instagram and on uh, Facebook under Dorit Carlson Heart Guide. So um, yeah, and I will go ahead and share all of those links okay. um, it, for the for the replay or or at the end if anybody wants wants to connect with Dorit. I highly recommend it. She does amazing work. Um, I will also put the link to you, to the to your first uh, Queen of Your Kingdom book, oh, yeah. which is available on Amazon. Uh, yeah, and stay tuned for another Operation Separation. We do this every Monday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, the replays will be available here forever. If you want to watch, just hashtag replay so that I know where you came in on. I will go ahead and respond to any of the comments uh, either either that you've already left or that you're leaving when you watch the replays, <sighs> please go ahead, follow Shell Station if you're not already doing so on Instagram, on LinkedIn, uh, on YouTube. I will drop that link separately um, because it is not Shell Station. Um, <laughs> that close. Uh, and, and again, stay tuned for more Operation Separation, for more ways to separate, separate yourself and get back to doing more of the things that you want to be doing. I'm Shell Shapiro. This is Dor Dorit Carlson. And today we talked about acknowledging the little things and why it's so important. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Bye for now.